I choose to use the phrase divine appointments when I talk about my testimony of my healing because there was a series of events that took place in a specific order and I know beyond a shadow of any doubt that every moment was orchestrated by my Heavenly Father. Each time I'm asked to share my testimony as it relates to a miraculous healing that I received eight days before my third birthday, I get excited about it because it blesses me as much as I hope it's blessing others to hear it. But I want to clarify something at the very onset of this testimony. Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before you were conceived in your mother's womb, I knew you. And before you left the womb, I consecrated you. Jeremiah 29, 11, a well-known verse says, For I know the plans that I have for you, plans for your good and not for your harm. That being the case, I have to believe that the Creator has a purpose for every one of us that He creates. And to live out our lives, finding that purpose means we've lived a successful life. Nothing happens by coincidence, accident, or luck. And I think those words are way overused by many people, including well-meaning Christians. I choose to use the phrase divine appointments when I talk about my testimony of my healing because there was a series of events that took place in a specific order. And I know beyond a shadow of any doubt that every moment was orchestrated by my Heavenly Father. My story begins on April 26, 1951, in Kings County Hospital, Brooklyn, New York. For all intents and purposes, I was a perfectly healthy, seven-pound baby girl. But when the blankets were unraveled, there was a horrific truth. My body was assembled as though from the hips down, my legs and my feet were attached backwards. I never viewed my toes until the night of my healing. My parents were told that um, it would take a series of surgeries, perhaps as many as six or eight. When I was a little bit older, they would start breaking my legs and recasting them and turning the feet little by little so that eventually I would be able to stand. But they were also prepared for me spending my life in a wheelchair, in a, with a walker, and in braces. They were good doctors, but they weren't the great physician. And he already had plans in motion for how I was going to be where I needed to be, when I needed to be there, in order for him to perform my miracle. My father was between jobs in Brooklyn, New York, and my uncle approached him one day and asked him if he would consider driving a car to North Carolina to deliver to his cousin. So he decided to do it. It was something where he could pick up a little extra money. So he left my mother with a three-year-old and newborn, and he headed out to Bridgeton, North Carolina. When he arrived there, he was just taken with the scenery and the friendliness of the people. And he thought, well, I can stay here and work a little while. He thought it was his great idea, but it was just God's way of getting us from Brooklyn to North Carolina. He was introduced to a friend whose name was Clyde Mercer. We referred to him as Uncle Clyde our entire life. But Clyde happened to mention to him that there was a man building a mill in Seven Springs, North Carolina man named Esler Davis and he put my dad in the truck one day and he said come on let's go meet this man and see if he has any need for a smart northern fellow. So they went and Esler interviewed my dad immediately liked him and offered him a job as a foreman. Part of the salary was a little tenant house behind the mill and there was a row of tenant houses where the supervisors lived. He accepted the job, contacted my mother, told her to sell everything she had, get on a bus, and he would meet them. 
So we wound up in Seven Springs, North Carolina. One of the other foremen had a wife who was a devout Pentecostal holiness woman. She, she was everybody's answer to everything. Her name will be familiar to you, especially her last name, which was Bazden. Her name was Bernice Bazden. She was Ronnie Bazden Sr.'s mom. And she and my mother became the best of friends, which was really good because my mom had been raised without her mother. And she was raised in a, uh, in fact, she attended Marble Collegiate Church under Dr. Norman Vincent Peel. So she and Bernice became the tightest of friends. And Bernice would talk to her all the time as the children ran around the yard. And I'd be sitting in the corner because I couldn't stand. I, I couldn't walk. And Bernice would say, I just cannot believe that God would mean for Nancy to live her life like this. I'm going to start praying in my fa and fasting. And my mother, not realizing what any of this meant, said, you do that. And we'll see what happens. It was a short time later, and Bernice excitedly ran across the yard telling my mother that the Holy Spirit had woken her up during one evening and gave her specific instructions which would result in my healing. Those instructions were to take me to the final service of an All Roberts Crusade that was taking place in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. We were to go to the Sunday night service in fact, it was the last night that Oral Roberts ever preached or conducted a crusade in North Carolina. No one knew how to drive. No one had a vehicle. But again, God had plans. He was orchestrating every step of the way. So our families jumped into a pickup truck owned by Davis Mills and headed to Rocky Mount, North Carolina on Sunday evening, April 18, 1954. When we got there, there was about 15,000 people in that crowd, the newspaper reports. There was the main crusade tent where the preaching went on, and then there were healings from the audience. And on the outer perimeter, there were tents where paraplegics or those unable to sit in the service or those who were unable to walk were laying in beds and on cots just waiting for Brother Roberts to walk through the midst and speak to them and pray with them. When we got there, they had a certain, they had to limit the number of people who were getting in the prayer line. And the method for doing that was to alphabetically issue cards to individuals. And once those cards were gone, you didn't get in the prayer line. I mean, he would have been there for days on end if everyone wanted to be in that line because everyone was there for one of two reasons, either to receive a miracle or to witness a miracle. So my mother got to the line, to the prayer desk, and they told her they were so sorry that there were no more cards available and we weren't getting in the prayer line that night. So she was very, very discouraged, went back to where Bernice was holding me and, and with our, our party of people. And she said, um, it's not gonna happen. We're not gonna be able to get in the prayer line. And Bernice staunchly said, well, I'm not leaving because I know what God told me. And I'm here in obedience to him. And I know that this is going to take place. So they were standing there for a while and my mother said, this woman approached her and tapped her on the shoulder and said, I was here last night with my daughter and we couldn't get in the prayer line, but I made sure my name was on the top of the list for tonight. But you know what? My daughter's already been healed. Service hasn't even started and my daughter's been healed. And I was on my way back to the desk to turn in my card so that someone else would be able to use it. She said, and the Holy Spirit stopped me in my tracks, turned me around and pointed me to you. And she said to my mom, would you mind telling me what your last name is? And my mother said, Di Martino. And she broke into a great big smile and flipped the card over and there was a D on it. Now, you can say what you will, but I believe if my last name had begun with Z, a Z would have been on that card.
because God doesn't make any mistakes. So we were able to get in the prayer line. And I was three, so I'm not going to say that I remember every detail, but there are shadowings and there are statements that were made that I clearly remember. This man took center stage in a chair. People who were supposed to be in the prayer line were called to the front. Uh, there was a stage that was set up with a ramp on both sides. You walked up on one side of the ramp, met with Brother Roberts, and walked off the other side of the ramp. But for some reason, he called an aide to his side, and he pointed into the crowd directly at me. And before I knew it, I was being passed over everybody's heads to the stage, to this man who picked me up and sat me on Brother Robert's knee. My mother was ushered to the front of the stage, and Brother Roberts asked her to describe what had happened, and she did as best she could because she could hardly speak. And at the same time, he was unlacing these hideous boots. They looked like tugboats. I remember them well. He was unlacing them. I remember the shadow of a huge head. He had large ears and a very big head, but his hands were what just, I couldn't imagine. I had never seen hands that large in my life. I remember him asking me if I knew who Jesus was. And I said, I sure did. I was three, but I knew who Jesus was. And then he said, do you love him? And I told him I sure did love Jesus. And he removed my boots and he took both of my feet in one hand and he prayed a simple prayer. And he set me down on the stage in front of him and he told me to look down, and I did. And for the first time in my life, I saw 10 toes. He told my mom to go stand at the end of the platform. And he popped me on my bottom and said, go to mommy. And I ran down the stage, jumped, skipped, hopped, ran right into her arms. And then so that everyone in the crowd could be sure that they had seen what they saw. He called me back to him, and I ran back up the stage and jumped right back into his lap. Needless to say, it, it was such an overwhelming moment. I had never been able to do that in my life. I could now go home and play with all the other kids and not have to sit and watch them. And he called my mom back up to the stage and he had previously asked her, Mother, do you believe that God's going to do this? And she gave a wonderful little Baptist response. She said, I think he can. And he explained to her after I had been healed that because there was just that little bit of doubt that there would always be a reminder for her of what had happened that night. And I was politely called pigeon toad for the rest of my life but I had such satisfaction in it because every time she would say, turn that foot out, I would say, it's your fault, it's you. You'd have to know my mother to know that that was, she just lived for that moment of hearing that and being reminded of it. And as I grew older, my mom would say, you know, it's time for you to start telling this story and not me. I had heard it a hundred times. It's time for you to tell it. And I honestly told her the reason that I hesitated in telling it, and that was some preachers were giving healing a bad name. It was a business for some preachers. And I didn't want to take away any of the glory from God or the respect that I had for the man of God by sharing something that someone would say I had either fabricated or was doing to get attention, which was the furthest thing from my mind. So I made God a deal and I said, I'll share it, but could you just do me a favor and allow somebody 
in the service to confirm what I've said. Because all I can do is be an eyewitness. And all an eyewitness is called to do is tell the truth. It's up to the jury and everyone else to believe it, to be the truth. The night I shared it at Kinston First PH, once I had concluded my statements, Lucille Tripp stood and asked Brother Jim Forehand if she could say something. And he did, and she proceeded to say, I was in that service that night with my husband, John, and I saw everything that she's told you, and every word of it is the truth. And I often said to John over the years, I wonder whatever happened to that little girl that night that was healed. And little did I know, I've been singing with her in the choir for 20 years. Then Mary Jarman stood up and she said, I was an 18 year old in that service that night. And I too can attest everything she said as being the truth. One night, Brother Jim Forehand, it was a Saturday night, he was going to be speaking that Sunday morning as a guest speaker at Kinston First. And he said, Nancy, when was it you said you were healed? And I said, uh, Sunday, August, uh, Sunday, April 18th, 1954, at an All Roberts Crusade in Rocky Mount. And he said, you're gonna be in church tomorrow? I said, of course I'm gonna be in church tomorrow. He said, well, I have a surprise for you. And we left it at that. The next day, Pastor Forehand shared with me in the congregation that the IPHC had commissioned the writing of a book which outlined every area of the tenets of faith of the International Pentecostal Holiness Church. The miracle section was assigned to Pastor T.B. Henry, and he did an in-depth study of the ministry of Oral Roberts. He also was there at the crusade, the closing night, on the night I was healed. And I'm quoting from page 166 of the book, Forward Ever Forward. He gives an example of one woman from Australia, living in Raleigh at the time, who suffered from a nervous disorder that caused her to be unable to stand. After Brother Roberts prayed for her, says Henry, she got off the stretcher and ran up and down the invalid room. That individual was evangelist Shirley Jones. And Shirley and I talked so many years, so many times of that night. Then Henry continues his remarkable report with more stories of the way God worked in Robert's healing services. In the prayer line under the big tent, I saw goiters disappear before my eyes and Brother Roberts had those afflicted persons turn to face the audience so that they could see them vanish. I saw a little child who was born club-footed when Brother Roberts took the child on his knees and prayed. The little feet straightened out as perfectly as if they had never been before. And I thought, how good is God? I don't have any trouble telling this to anybody anymore because it's documented. And I find it easier to share, knowing that people are not looking at me, but they're looking at the events to led, that led to this miraculous healing. And it's all because of divine appointment. I realized that God could have healed me the moment I was born. But he establishes a path and puts people in our path our entire life long. Brother Roberts was the instrument that was used in bringing about my healing. I want to make it clear that I cannot heal. I do not claim any healing power. Only God has power to heal. I am a servant and instrument God is using, a point of contact to help people release their faith. Our faith is in God. No more important than Bernice Basden or the lady that turned the card back in. They all played a huge role in my miracle. 
And I believe even today, God puts us in the path of people that we need to either encourage or receive encouragement from, that we need to say, don't give up. It doesn't matter what doctors say. The great physician has the last say in everything. So continue on, pray for your miracle. Don't ever give up on the brink of a miracle. Hold on, hold fast, trust God's faithfulness. He will bring people into your life, maybe for a moment, maybe for a season, and maybe for a lifetime. And in his time, in his way, his miracle will be performed. Thank you.